for the kind invitation and uh, thank Alfonso for the kind invitation. So it's a great pleasure to be here. <coughs> so, so today uh, I will talk about some joint work with uh, Louis Nirenberg. So <coughs> there is a, a classical work of A.D. Alexandrov. So it says the following. So if you uh, have a closed, meaning a, a hypersurface embedded in Euclidean space. So it's bounded and uh, no boundary. So it's a closed surface. So if you assume that at every point of the surface, the mean curvature is I mean, the mean curve is constant everywhere yeah, on the surface. So then this M has to be a sphere. So uh, <coughs> a priori, you do not need to assume that your surface, uh, this, this is a pointer? No. It is? Wow. Oh, it also changed. Thanks. <coughs> so, uh, a priori, you can assume there are holes, yeah, but eventually the result tells you uh, it does not have a hole. Yeah. So this uh, surface has to be embedded, meaning it should not have self-intersection. Yeah. If there is a self-intersection, then the result is no longer true, even in R3. So that's a, a very well-known example by Wente. Yeah. Even though in higher dimensional case, so such examples were found earlier. Uh, so the last example was found was in, in R3 even. Yeah. <coughs> so it's if it's immersed, nam namely, so there are immersed, there are torus somehow immersed, namely, it has self inter intersection and mean curvature is still constant and sitting R3. <coughs> so what is a mean curvature? So <coughs> a mean curvature, so if, if let's say you have a piece of surface, so let's say this piece of surface is given by the graph of a smooth function. Yeah. So this is a function defined in Rn so there's a graph. Suppose you have smooth uh, derivatives and so on. Then at every point here, then the mean curvature there is given by this. So you take the gradient u and then divide it by this and then take another divergence. Take divergence so you get a number. And the number tell you this is the mean curvature there. So that's the mean curvature operator. Or equivalently, it is like this. You have a surface like this. Then you go to a point. That point has a mean curvature. But then what is this value? You take a plane which touches the surface at the point. Then you look at the surface nearby and view it as the graph of a function. Yeah. So then you take that function, you calculate the Laplacian, and then you at the origin, so that's exactly the mean curvature. So this is the mean curvature. <coughs> so then the theorem of A.D. Alexandrov said if the mean curvature is constant, then it has to be a sphere. So in 1997, and uh, <coughs> I proved a result uh, like this. So suppose you, so maybe, maybe before that I should say how this theorem is proved. This theorem is proved by the following. So Alexandrov proved that this surface has a symmetry with respect to 
So you take any direction. Then in this direction, there will be a hyperplane so that this, uh, this, this surface will be symmetric with respect to that hyperplane. Okay? So any surface has this property, must be a sphere. Yeah. Is you take a surface, then in every direction there is a plane about which your surface is symmetric with. Yeah. So then, then it has to be a sphere. So, <coughs> so in 1997, I look at <coughs> a situation like this. So you take a surface, and this is x n plus 1 direction. You fix a direction. And uh, <coughs> I assume that the mean curvature has a, an order in this direction. Namely, if you take two points, any two points, in a line, which is parallel to the x n plus 1 axis, you assume that this mean curvature has an order. So h of b will be less or equal than h of a. So if you have uh, four points like this, then you have the same order. So under this, uh, under this uh, assumption, <coughs> So I was thinking I might be able to prove a symmetry result with respect to this uh, direction. So namely, I was thinking that under this monotonicity assumption, then I might be able to prove that M is symmetric about some hyperplane which is uh, orthogonal to this direction, yeah. xn plus 1 equal to a number. Well. I, I couldn't quite prove that. So what I could prove is the following. So I add an additional assumption. So this mean curvature is a function which is defined on the surface. So if you give me a point of the surface, I give you a value. Elsewhere, you don't have a value. So I assume this function, which is defined on this surface, can be extended as a monotone Lipschitz function in the whole space. So this is an assumption. So I assume that my <coughs> so then I proved this symmetry result. So of course if the mean curvature is constant, so you can extend it as a constant function, which is uh <coughs> <coughs> so and uh, I was <coughs> I was thinking for I, I sort of felt that there may be this result can go through without this. Yeah, I that's that I was and, and I felt that this would uh, mean that there's some interesting uh, maximum principle, half lemma, some kind of variations which make things work. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, I, uh, maybe maybe around, I forgot which year, maybe around 2003 or four, some years ago, and I, I talked to uh, uh, Louis Nuremberg, and I described that result, and I was saying that maybe one could just you know, prove it without it. So so that would mean there is some kind of new maximum principle which makes things work. So, so then, <coughs> uh, and then I described to Nuremberg, and actually the second week, he came to Rutgers, so we discussed mathematics, and then he actually put on the blackboard this picture. <laughs> and, uh, and then I look at it, I you see, these are symmetric bump, and these are line like that, and uh, it's monotone. It's actually equal everywhere. You draw a line. The curvature in one dimension is the usual curvature. They are actually equal, but this is not symmetric. So I was kind of really worried, and uh, because I remember uh, this paper uh, was kind of written in a rush. 
and that's a paper dedicated to my colleague at the time, Treffs. So I remember I, I, I made some last minute change <laughs> in my manuscript. So I was uh, kind of worried. So uh, uh, Louis said, uh, let's look at the proof. So he was sitting there. And I, I actually ran through the proof. And uh, he didn't uh, detect error. He looked OK. And, uh, and it turns out that this picture can actually, you can cook up this picture so that this mean curvature can be extended as a monotone function, which is in C alpha for every alpha less than 1. It simply fails uh, Lipschitz. You cannot manage such a picture which can be extended as a monotone Lipschitz function. Well, <coughs> but this picture uh, does not satisfy uh, this condition. So because from the proof, somehow actually this thing uh, is important. So M should stay on one side of any hyperplane parallel to x to this axis. It should stay on one side. So for example, if you put here, it is tangent, but you have a piece you know, on both sides. Uh, so <coughs> so our conjecture then is uh, this symmetry holds under the additional condition S. Yeah. Actually, uh, Louis proposed this, uh, this version. Yeah. So <coughs> uh, then, so we, we started working on it. And uh, so naturally, one should start with one dimensional case. Yeah. So, uh, so then we proved this result uh, in one dimensional case. So it's OK. So that conjecture. Uh, holes in one dimensional case. And the proof uh, uses ODE arguments. It's kind of ordinary differential equations arguments, and actually quite tricky. So, actually, uh, two months ago, we wrote another paper on this subject, which I will ex tell what it is. And, and there, we included another proof of this in an appendix, which is uh, simpler, but still somewhat tricky. Yeah. I think it's still somewhat tricky. It's an ODE argument. But of course, the argument does not quite uh, extend to higher dimensions. So for higher dimensions, one version <coughs> would be, let's forget about condition S. Yeah. Let's just take a strictly convex surface, just nice, strictly convex surface. And then we look at this version, whether one can prove it or not. So we certainly believe the result should be true. But we have not been able to prove it yet. So let's recall this problem now. And let's now uh, only look at a convex surface now. Just take a nice, smooth, strictly convex surface like this. And uh, <coughs> we assume that take any two points which have the same, uh, uh, I mean, which is on a line parallel to the xn plus 1 axis. You take two points, and you assume that at the top point, the mean curvature is less or equal than the mean curvature at the bottom. It's just a monotone. You, ca you can have another monotonicity. You just reverse your picture. Yeah. So, so this is the main assumption. The question is, can one prove M is symmetric about some point uh, uh, some x n plus one equal to lambda. It's a hyperplane, so it's I th this is a very uh, uh, simple statement, but still we don't know how to prove it. So what we knew is the following, which we proved maybe maybe a few a few years ago. It was <coughs> and uh, the theorem 
is the following. So if we assume an additional assumption, for this additional assumption says the following, take any line parallel to the xn plus 1 axis and touches your surface at a point. And you assume that the touching has finite order. I mean, this, this is a finite order. As a function, it ha starts with a power. It's not like exponential or something. You make such a, a finite order assumption. So then we can prove it. Uh, then we can prove it. <coughs> so, <coughs> and uh, we, s we certainly believe that without this assumption, it should still work. But we, we just don't know how to do it. Yeah. So, <coughs> so I will, I w I would like to uh, describe uh, the proof of A.D. Alexandrov. So that's a classical result and and a beautiful one. So this is the theorem of A.D. Alexandrov. So you take a closed, I mean compact, no boundary surface sitting in Euclidean space. So it's embedded. Namely, there's no self-intersection. You assume that at every point of this surface, the mean curvature uh, is the same. So the conclusion is then this surface has to be a sphere. So a sphere certainly has this property. So this is the theorem of A.D. Alexandrov. <coughs> so here is the proof of Alexa Alexandrov. So you take your surface M. So I'm drawing the surface looking like a topological, like looking like a sphere. It doesn't have to be. The proof works equally well. I mean, the same proof works. Uh, uh, when you have some holes in there. So I let the surface sit like this. I take an axis, xn plus 1 direction. And then I let the surface touches the plane xn plus 1 equal to 0. I just make such a normalization. And we are going to prove that this surface is going to be symmetric with respect to some hyperplane, xn plus 1 equal to a constant. And if you can prove this for every direction, then this surface has to be a sphere. So that's a, uh, an elementary consideration. So this is the symmetry uh, Alexander of proofs. So <coughs> For lambda small, so we are going to take planes, xn plus 1 equal to lambda. We are going to move this plane down, so like moving plane. You m so I, I only draw a line, OK? This is a moving line, moving plane. So it's, it's supposed to be a hyperplane. So you move this plane down, and you reflect the top piece the part above this plane, I call it as lambda. I reflect that piece to the part below this plane. I call it as lambda prime. Okay. So <coughs> for lambda small, when you reflect it, you can prove that as lambda prime, I forgot a prime here, should be inside M. OK? And uh, also, this normal somehow points down. This means pointing down. This, this is quite clear, this, but because the normal here should be uh, down. And uh, well, this actually requires some arguments, but it's OK. Yeah, you can prove it. Uh, it's, uh, you can prove that, because there, there could be a lot of wiggling somehow. But still, this is true. Yeah, you can prove that. So for lambda small, you 
we have this property. We call it star lambda. Okay, this is a property. So I cut my surface with a plane x n plus one equal to lambda. I reflect the piece above this plane, and I assume the reflection stays inside M, and I assume that here the new. I mean, at the corner here, it points down. That's right. So then <coughs> I will go to, I move this plane down. I want this property to hold. This property will break when the lambda reaches here, certainly. So therefore, I will have a maximal interval so that this property holds. So in the open interval, it holds. I will get the uh, maximum interval. So that's going to be the lambda bar where I would like to prove symmetry. Okay? I would like to prove that the surface is symmetric with respect to xn plus 1 equal to this lambda bar. So, <coughs> so at this lambda bar, so something happens which prevents this property to continue to hold. <coughs> so the first possibility is somehow the reflected piece touches a piece below. So it got stuck there. Okay, so certainly you cannot move the plane any further. <coughs> Another possibility is Case one does not happen. Okay, so however, here somehow they become two surfaces become tangent to each other. So it's it's quite easy to see that if you don't have interior touching and also here you are not in this situation, then you can still move your plane a little bit. That that's quite elementary. Uh, uh, you can argue uh, by elementary means. So, so what you ca you need to prove is, if case one happens, then you want to prove that your surface is actually symmetric with respect to this plane. Okay. So, then you argue that the second case does not really occur. You rule out case two. Okay, so once you do these two steps, you prove the symmetry. Okay, you are saying that it has to be case one, and you have proved that in case one, actually the surface is symmetric with respect to x n plus one equal to lambda bar. Okay, <coughs> so how to prove this? So for case one, you prove it by using the so-called strong maximum principle, which I will state. So, <coughs> so you take this point, when it gets stuck at interior point, you can, uh, you can see that it has to be like this. It's not going to be vertical. Okay? So if case one happens, these two surfaces, the red one and the black one, they are all graphs of smooth functions. Okay. So then, and you also know that the mean curvature is equal to constant. The mean curvature, as we wrote it, we have a mean curvature operator. Okay. Then the mean. So, so then you plug u into the operator and v into the operator. They are the same. So the difference is going to be zero. Okay. So then you just use mean value theorem. You uh, you know uh, mean value theorem to write it as derivative, and then you will see that you can u minus v will satisfy an elliptic second order elliptic operator L. Okay, this this you just use mean value theorem, f of one minus f of zero is equal to the integral from zero one f prime of t. Yeah, you use that. Then you get actually an elliptic operator. Why is elliptic? Because this mean curvature operator, the form, 
uh, uh, is elliptic. Yeah. So you have an elliptic operator, and the difference of u minus v satisfies an elliptic equation. And u minus v have the same value here, and greater or equal to zero nearby. So then there is a, a strong maximum principle. It's a property for second order elliptic operator. It tells you, in this case, u minus v must be zero nearby in an open neighborhood of this point. Then you are done, because whenever you touch at one point, the two surfaces actually stick together nearby. So you can argue that your surface have to coincide. Yeah. Two surfaces will be the same. One remark is when using this maximum principle, you, the only thing you need is a differential inequality. It doesn't have to be equality. So, so this proves that case one leads to symmetry. Case one leads to symmetry. So now case two says case one does not occur, but somehow they touch. I mean, the, they are tangent to each other there. So this case should be ruled out. So, so now you look at here, you, you, you turn yourself around, and looking at these two pieces, the red one and the black one, you think of it as a surface when you view in this direction. So they become regular surface. So you still call the red one u and the black one v, corresponds to function v. Then this function will still satisfy an elliptic equation because the mean curvature is a constant. So this argument still works. So you have that. And u minus v is positive because you have assumed that case 1 does not occur. So you, you make your, this as t, and, and those directions which enter the, uh, into the blackboard, uh, I, I call it y. So so you are on one side of t, t bigger than 0. You look at your picture this way. Yeah. And in one dimensional k, in two dimensional, if your surface is a curve, then you don't have y. So you are just having. So then u minus v is 0 here. And that the derivative is also 0. The derivative is also 0. However, there is something called Hopf lemma. Hopf lemma tells you that this cannot happen. What Hopf lemma tells you, roughly speaking, is in a region, I if you in a domain, if somehow your your function is greater than zero but zero at a point, so usually calculus tell you the derivative inside should be greater or equal than zero. This is what calculus tells you. So what Hopf's lemma tells you is that if this function satisfies some elliptic inequality, then the derivative has to be positive. Namely, you go from 0 to positive with a linear speed. This is what Hopf's lemma tells you. So this violates linear speed, because this tells you the derivative is 0. So, so, so if you have if the function satisfies some elliptic inequality, second order elliptic inequality, then it can go only go from 0 to positive with a linear speed. So this is what half lemma tells you. So then this case violates the half lemma, which says it has to be case 1, and uh, you proved uh, the theorem. Actually, Alexandrov proved the theorem. So now let's mimic the proof to see whether it can go through. Well, so case 1 still leads to the desired symmetry. The reason is, so in our case, we are in this situation, and the mean curvature are not equal, but have an order, have an order. <coughs> and 
this inequality is the order. Well, the strong maximum principle works with that order. You don't have to have equality. Yeah. So <coughs> therefore, case one still leads to the symmetry. You don't really have to do further work. Yeah. It just follows from the same argument as Alexandrov. The subtle one is <coughs> case two. How to rule out case two? So let's just take this case two and looking at the curve case. So we are in R2, and the convex surface becomes a convex curve, for example. Yeah, let's take a convex curve. And then we reflect with respect to a line instead of a plane. And then the reflected piece is the red one. It, it, you don't have interior touching with the bottom line, bottom curve. However, here is tangent to each other. Okay, and then you assume your curvature has an order. Yeah. So then you you turn this picture ninety degree, and then this t-axis become this, red become that, black become this. So you think of this red one still you call it u, the graph of u and v, graph of v. So you know that u is positive and V is positive because I'm assuming, for the time being, I'm assuming strict convexity. So, and U is, I know U is bigger than V also. Yeah, because I assume case one doesn't happen. So U is positive, U prime is positive. This is by strict convexity. U is bigger than V, okay? And you know U and V coincide here and the derivative are both the same. Okay, so in the, in the situation of uh, uh, for a, for Alexandrov, you look at u minus v, and then you see that u minus v satisfies some differential inequality, and that inequality does not allow this to happen. Yeah, that's the half lemma. So you get. So now let's look at the inequality. Well. Our condition is like this. You take a point here and take a point at the bottom. The curvature has an order, has an order. They are not a number, so they, they have an order. So which means this is the reflected piece. This means here and here there is an order. Right? So that means at this point, this point and that point, the curvature has an order. Namely, I take a point S, I go up, to the V curve, I go horizontally to the U curve, I go down. That's the T point. So now the differential inequality is the mean curvature at T for U should be less or equal than the mean curvature of V at another point. You are not really having a differential inequality at the same point. You are comparing at two different points. Okay, if here t is in this inequality, if t is equal to s, then you rule out this case by the half lemma. However, the two points are not quite the same. So you want to prove that this is not possible. The one-dimensional case is like this. Okay, so well, actually, uh, in one-dimensional case, we can we proved this. We proved this by some quite tricky argument, actually. So recently, we had another argument uh, 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 which, which is somewhat less tricky, but still somewhat tricky, yeah. So doesn't go to higher dimensions somehow. And for example, this u prime is positive is really needed. If, uh, if you change this to u prime greater or equal than 0, the result fails. So it's quite uh, subtle in a way. It's not, uh, yeah. <coughs> so how about in higher dimension then? <coughs> so in higher dimension, then, <coughs> so then one, if one can establish a, an analog, a, a variation of the Hopf lemma in the following form, then we are finished because we can rule out case two. So what would be the 
uh, uh, exact formulation. So this is a variation of the half lemma for n greater or equal than 2. So take omega equal to t n y, OK? And this is, this, is, this is t equal to 0. So it's like this, t equal to 0. So we have two smooth functions in the closure. And u is bigger than v, bigger than 0 in the open set. And u and v coincide on this line, on this, on this piece, t equal to 0. And at the origin, they are both 0. And ut is equal to 0 at the origin, which forces vt to be 0 at the origin, because u is above v. And ut is positive in omega. And the main condition is whenever u is equal to v, so s is here, and t go back, and u and v are the same. Okay, you keep the same y variable. Whenever they are the same, then the mean curvature is less or equal than the other one. So that's exactly the situation. So we want to rule out this. Yeah. <coughs> we, 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 we believe this should be ruled out, but we can't quite prove it. Yeah. So <coughs> of course, you don't have to put mean curvature operator here. To start studying this problem, one should really put a Laplacian here to study. Okay. If Laplacian works, this will work. And uh, if Laplacian doesn't work, okay, one should put Laplacian here. So we'll have Laplacian u less than Laplacian v. Yeah. That's, that's the one. Of course, that's always the one we look at it. And, uh, but we, we, we cannot prove this. <coughs> but but actually, the geometric problem tells you more. Tells you that this u and v are linked. Namely, when you reflect this v, you put that together with u, you get a c smooth function. Yeah, that's, that will give you some more. And uh, of course, we would like to have a half lemma without that, that thing. Yeah. And uh, we tend to believe that should be irrelevant. But we, we don't mind to have that at the beginning, which will simplify things. About this con condition t, this finite order of touching, it simply means this u in t derivative, you don't have in infinite vanishing. Yeah, yeah, something like this. So there, there are a couple of things you can throw in to simplify it. But Little is known even with the above assumptions. So then, but nevertheless, we proved this geometric problem under this condition t. Yeah. So namely, uh, we have, so our proof actually uses global information. So we, we were not able to establish this local Hopf lemma because there are some difficulties we, which we could not uh, overcome. Uh, but we could prove the result under this condition, and which uses global information. But uh, certainly, we believe that absolutely there should be this version of half. There's no, no way this, this, this version of half fails. But we just couldn't quite get it yet. Uh, OK, so now I describe the proof of, uh, so how, how many, I have five minutes maybe? Uh, ten, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Alfonso is kind. <laughs> OK, so let's go back to the theorem. <coughs> so the theorem I, I'm going to describe the proof is the following. So take a strictly convex surface, smooth boundary, and you assume, the main assumption is to assume that in this direction, if I have two points, A and B, then the mean curvature at B should be greater 
uh, less or equal than the mean curvature at A. So this is the main assumption. Then we want to prove symmetry, but we cannot quite prove it. But we proved it under an additional assumption. We proved it by assuming that whenever you have a line which is parallel to xn plus 1, and you touch, the line touches the surface, then the touching should be of, of finite order. Yeah. So for example, if your surface is real analytic, it has to be like that. So, uh, so this is a condition. So we are going to prove this under this condition. So as we described the proof of A.D. Alexandrov, so if one is able to establish a corresponding Hopf lemma, corresponding variation of the Hopf lemma, then this theorem will follow by the same procedure. Yeah. Uh, the, the trouble is we, st we still have cannot prove that local result. So the proof I describe here is of similar spirit in a way, still through maximum principle, and uh, but uses global information. <coughs> so this is the proof I will describe. Now. Okay. So. <coughs> so. <coughs> so we have a lambda bar. We have a lambda bar, and uh, it's where we stop when using this procedure of the moving plane method. So we stop here, and we assume that the reflected surface does not touch the surface below this hyperplane. And then we want to rule out this. We don't want this to happen. So let's introduce some uh, notations. First, we call the surface below this plane by m lambda bar. So this is this part. And uh, whenever I have x on this part, I go up and hit, I go straight up and hit this plane. I call it y bar. Okay, I can always hit that. Yeah. If along the way, I can hit the reflected surface, I collect the points and put it in an open set. This is O. Somewhere, for example, here, you go up, you don't hit that. So that's outside your open set O. So O is going to be an open set, a closed set, uh, uh, open set, because my S lambda prime doesn't include the boundary. So it's open set. So Y of X, I define, is defined in O, and that's the point where I hit. Yeah, I go from x, I go straight up. I hit the surface, I call the point y of x. So what you would like to prove is this cannot happen, right? Yeah, this x minus. OK. So I'm going to call the distance from x minus y of x, I call it tau of x. It's going to be a function. So in this open set, I define a function tau. The function tau is defined by Taking x, I go straight up. I go to y of x. I measure the distance. So that's I call tau of x. So tau of x is a smooth function. And on the boundary of O, the value of tau is 0, because on the boundary, is they become the same. Yeah? Uh, tau, uh, wait, wait a minute. This is not, uh, uh, no, no. Uh, uh, OK, forget about what I said. Uh, uh, there's another uh, function, tau bar. I measure the distance from x to the plane. So there I have two functions. One is this distance, one is that distance. Okay. On the boundary of O, the value of tau and the value of tau bar are the same. Because here, both tau and tau bar are 0. Here, tau is like this, tau bar is also like that. So tau and tau bar coincide on the boundary of the open set, but tau is strictly uh, smaller than tau, tau, tau bar. Uh, anyway, tau is strictly positive inside. Okay, strictly positive inside. 
Okay. <coughs> so tau is strictly positive inside, and tau coincides with tau bar. And actually, at this point, somehow, you see tau and tau, tau bar are all zero, actually, there. Okay. So I'm going to look at that part of the open set, O epsilon. Namely, I cut it with lambda bar minus epsilon. I, I look at there. So I re re remember for the half lemma, only this little piece count. Yeah, when you try to apply half lemma. So now, actually there, you only care this little neighborhood. So now, I still care near that, but I, I allow it to go far away as, as long as I don't go too much below. I look, so that part of the surface count. So I, 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 I let it go around, allow it. So here is the main proposition. The proposition says that there are two constants, epsilon and c, such that this tau is greater or equal than a multiple c of tau bar for any x in O epsilon. So I have two functions, and then I restrict my O epsilon as the O, but between here, yeah, between here. So then I want to prove that my two function has this order, has this order. So our proof of this key proposition does not use the finite touching assumption. So that's a general proof. However. Uh, we could not get any contradiction yeah, from here. So this immediately gives you a contradiction if you assume a finite touching. Yeah, a finite touching. So the main work is to prove this. And actually, this part has nothing to do with this finite uh, order of touching. Somehow, all we always feel we may have missed something, may not be that difficult. We, we are missing something. <laughs> we don't know what, uh, but we couldn't find it. Yeah. OK. So proposition has not need, does not need condition t, which means the finite touching. And proposition plus condition t immediately give you a, a contradiction. So proposition, this proposition is a key step. So the proof goes like this. So I look at O epsilon. This is an open set, but lives on your surface. And on the boundary, you can uh, prove this. You can prove that on the boundary, this is bigger than that. So this is not hard. And you write it in this form, because this is power is tau bar is small. And uh, you have this. Yeah, you can do that. And, uh, <coughs> and if proposition fails for this epsilon and c, then this sigma will be tau minus that, will has a negative minimum in O epsilon. This is just by contradiction you have this statement. So we are going to look at the equation of tau and compare it to the equation of this guy. So, I w so then you use the main assumption, and you can find a second order linear elliptic operator such that L tau is less than zero, L of this is bigger than zero. That imply this cannot have an interior minimum. But to find this L is kind of uh, uh, tricky. It's not quite clear. Uh, actually, the most obvious L does not work somehow. Yeah, change things, change the sign. So anyway, so l here you put like this. I, I look at in this variable u and v. I look at u and v. And then <coughs> the main assumption tells you mean curvature operator at, at one place is less than at another place. So now I let tau to be s minus t. Here are the place these two functions have the same value. And that's exactly the tau in our situation. So we differentiate this. And then we have all this uh, I'm not writing. So then 
you will see that L tau less or equal than zero if you choose L to be H zero zero. There are some all this. Yeah, it's complicated. So this is an important part, and this doesn't you don't care about the size and all this thing and and this L is elliptic, you can prove this. And uh, condition T, oh, then then this L works if you choose your L this way. So you make it work. So the condition T tells you that your two surfaces are like this, and this should go to 1, and that, that is a contradiction. So this is very quick. And the result can work for not only for mean curvature. Mean curvature is the average of the principal curvatures. It actually works for general, uh, uh, general f, symmetric function of the principal curvatures, f lambda i positive, which means ellipticity. And we also assume f concave in lambda i. Uh, this should not be needed, but so far uh, we carry that for our estimates. That, that should be irrelevant. But uh, OK, so I will stop here.